Okay. I understand that. <laughs> You're gonna play that card, huh? But here's the deal. I threw kids. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, right. Although now I'm nervous. Yeah, to and also don't forget that has it comes with music. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want that. Yeah, who wants this? <laughs> Presents for your kids, toys for your kids that they are only allowed to play with while you're still sleeping in the morning. And so Vicky bought the kids. It's kind of genius, right? She bought them a karaoke machine <laughs> for that purpose, not thinking it through. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck were you thinking? So, so uh, uh, Arrow has a little karaoke machine. And I call it the Big Dad Angry Machine. <laughs> that's it, that's it. <laughs> Who wants to go first? I'll go. Um, uh, <laughs> I, have, I have a question. Okay, what's your question? Um, who cut your hair so, so short? And did you just say, give me the Dean Winchester? <laughs> I showed I showed the barber a photo of you in season three. I was like, I want to look like him. And then the barber was like, Listen, I can't work miracles. <laughs> As I was saying it, I realized oh, what a terrible trap I made for myself. Like, no, I'm a barber, not a magician. <laughs> I can get a haircut around here, and they call it a barbershop, but they said they're free right now. And I went down, you know, the street and went into the barbershop, and I said, can you just take it, like, neaten it up a little bit? And he took his scissors, and the first snip was, like, down to my scalp. And so then he had to take the rest of it off, otherwise it would have been a bald spot right there. And, um... Turned out that uh, next door was the barbershop. He went to a mechanic's garage. <laughs> So this is, uh, this is my Roman haircut. Well, I, I, I actually think you look good, man. I, I, I think you look yeah. nice and happy. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say, man, it's funny you were actually complimenting him earlier about it. I said, I didn't think it looks good, man. It was a little weird. It was weird. And then he went in for a kiss. And I, I did. <laughs> well, hey, it went in wrong. <laughs> Favorite Italian food and which food that you would like to try? And the second one is, can I have the last unicorn? Well, uh, favorite Italian food? Yes. I love all of the Italian food that I come across, but I have to say I most look forward to the Roman artichokes yeah. and the cacio e pepe. You just love those bitches? What? I'm <laughs> sorry, I wasn't listening. I, I realize that this is not a unicorn. In fact, it's a llama. It's okay. But you can have it anyway. Um, and then to answer your the first part of your question, penne uh, alla arabiata. That's my favorite. I also just like the way it sounds, but I also like the translation, which is angry pasta. <laughs> I like it a spicy food. It's <laughs> good. Um, yeah, I, uh, the, although Daniel does make a, um, it's like a, it's like a, a Italian sausage and, um, uh, like a 
green vegetable with like these broccoli or broccoli rob or peas uh, in into like a butter sauce pasta with the shells. Is this sad or did she just make That's it? That's just something that Camille makes. Well, she's you know she's got she's she's, she's part Sicilian, yeah. So she 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 knows how to spice things up. Uh, but that is also. <laughs> hey. Yeah. She does refer to Misha as her boyfriend, so. <laughs> Which is funny, because so I got <laughs> <laughs>
Um, let's take some questions, big guy. Over there. Hi. Hi. So first we wanted to thank you both for being for putting so much love and passion to love in and cast. So thank you so much for all the work you did. Sorry, I'm really nervous because you look so three dimensional right now. <laughs> We work hard on that. So but a very two-dimensional personality, so... I think so. So I was wondering, if you could rewrite the finale, what would you change? I think that I would probably have Sam and Dean die in, in episode one, uh, 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 thinking E.T., you know, right? And then Castiel would be standing alone on a bridge. And you just say, finally, peace. It'll be peace for when you are alone. I mean, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different ways that I think this show could have wrapped up. Um, I had, I had ideas, I had dreams about how the show would end. Um, but I Do you all know Jensen's dream? No! Yes. How many know the dream? Oh, just a handful. You want to tell it? <laughs> you want to hear me tell that dream? Yes! yes. I feel like crying. I had a very, very, for those of you, I had a very, very vivid dream, almost like a waking dream, uh, years ago, and it essentially was, um, uh, it was, there was no words, there was no, it was just this music, and I don't know if you guys have ever seen that movie Man on Fire with Denzel Washington, but there, the, um, the, uh, score to that, the, the soundtrack, there's this, there's this beautifully written score by an American composer, actually, I can't remember, I'm blanking on his name. Um, that was playing in my head while I was envisioning this, this vision that I had, and it was uh, like the flyover of like just expansive farmlands as far as the eye can see. And there's just a long, long road going north and south, meeting a very, very long road going east and west. And Dean, uh, sitting outside the, the Impala, parked in the intersection, nobody around, just desolate, every which way you look. And Dean's sitting there, and he and I, I get up, and I look way down the road, and I can see the distance something moving towards me. And kind of like, did you see um, uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia? When uh, Omar Sharif is riding up the, the horse camel, yeah, on the camp. Yeah, camp, camp, camp. Yeah. It's kind of like, like that. And then as it gets closer, we realize it's a, a, a person on a motorcycle. And a person on a motorcycle uh, comes all the way to the, to, the, to the crossroads, to the intersection. And um, he gets off the bike, we never see a face, because they've got a, a helmet on. And Dean kind of looks at the, you know, nods at the motorcycle rider uh, as he parks the bike and just sits there. And then Dean walks around the Impala, kind of like putting his hand on it like this. And makes a complete circle around the Impala and then pulls the keys out of his pocket and hands it to the motorcycle rider. And the motorcycle rider, you never see his face, takes off the helmet and hands the helmet to Dean. And then cut to the Impala driving away. And Dean's standing there holding the motorcycle helmet next to a motorcycle. And then he gets on the motorcycle and he drives in the opposite direction because he doesn't need a passenger seat anymore. And that was it. So I always thought I was like, when I had that dream, it was very vivid, and it like it rocked me. It's it was so vivid that I, I can still tell the story to this day as though it happened. Um, and it was.
was because Sam had died and Dean was trying to move on with his life in the best way he knew how, but he couldn't drive that car anymore because it just reminded him of his brother. And that was it. That was, that was the vision that I had. I don't know, why are we talking about this thing? I, I will say that we all spent we spent so much time with these characters and in the relationships between these characters that it became a blurry line, at least for me. I, I know this is true for you too, between the the characters and our own emotional selves. And saying saying goodbye to Dean for Cass was also emotionally it was emotionally exhausting for me. And you... <laughs> this is all something that shouldn't be. <laughs> um, <laughs> poor guy. Um, yeah, I don't know. When you spend that much time with a character, it becomes part of you. No, it's, we're good. it's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I remember when you told that story when we were doing an in interview. And it was you, me, and Jared, and we were doing this long interview, and you told that story, and both Jared and I teared up when you told the story, because it, became, it becomes so real for all of us, you know? And then you start dreaming those dreams. I had a similar experience just now, uh, working with Gotham Knights at the very beginning of the season. Woo! I had this... I had a dream that was so vivid. And I called the producers, which is a weird thing to do, but I was like, guys, this just feels like you start to spend enough time with the character and thinking about it enough, it affects your dreams. And I called them and I was like, I think I know how Harvey Dent has to become Two-Face the end of the season. And I told them what happened in my dream. And they were like, yes. And that's what they ended up writing. It was like, yet shot the end of the show. And and we were like, yes, that's yes. that has to be it. So I would say I would like to see that ending. Yeah, me too. I would like to actually just film that. Because there's no words exchange. I mean it's it's I mean it would probably be a, a two-day shoot at yeah, top. We can afford it. You have an Impala. This is true. <laughs> I know how to be an Impala. I know how to get one of the cast members. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um I, I I will say that uh there, there was a scene in the pilot of the Winchesters that was largely um, shot in the way that I saw that dream, and it was when we see Dean in uh, the pilot of the Winchesters. There was that long road with nothing but just farmland on either side. That was kind of what I was envisioning uh, for that dream, and that we we did that a little bit as a tip to to that. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was cool. But if I could change the pilot, I would probably just um, have uh, hung a pillow on the uh, piece of rebar. <laughs> 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 <laughs>